Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2023 Eccles Center Bryant Lecture, to everybody who's here with us in person and everybody who's joining us remotely from around the world. My name is Polly Russell, and I'm the head of the Eccles Center at the British Library. The Eccles Centre was set up in 1991 with a generous endowment from Mary Eccles and David Eccles to encourage scholarship and learning about the Americas using the British Library's world-class collections. And while I have a moment, I just would like to thank all our institutional partners, fellows and friends, the ATBL and the Eccles family for supporting the work of the Eccles Centre. Working closely with colleagues across the British Library, the Eccles Centre is involved in a wide range of activities. We sponsor researchers from all backgrounds and from all parts of the world. We fund two £20,000 Writers' Awards with Hay Festivals. We collaborate on research projects, we support teachers and students, and we organise a whole range of events across the year. And if you are interested in the Americas, we are interested in hearing from you, so please get in touch. The Eccles Centre has been hosting an annual lecture since 1993, and in 1995 it was named in honour of Douglas W. Bryant. And since I think we're all here, I thought you'd like to just hear a little bit about Douglas Bryant. He was born in California in 1913, and after serving in the US as a naval officer in World War II, he returned to his home to serve as the, as the associate librarian of the University of California at Berkeley. In 1950, Doug was recruited into the US Foreign Service to manage American libraries in Great Britain. Two years later, he began a long career at Harvard University, becoming the director of the university library from 1972 until his retirement. Throughout these decades, Doug maintained deep ties with British librarians and academics, and in 1979, he founded the American Trust for the British Library. His knowledge and passion enabled the Trust to augment the American materials in the British Library's collections in very important ways. Doug served as a trustee and executive director and president of the American Trust for the British Library. And in 1995, in recognition of his work and support for the British Library, the Eccles Centre named his annual lecture in his honour. The Bryant Lecture remains the, one of the most important events in the Eccles calendar, an opportunity to explore debates and ideas related to the USA and its relation to the world with experts in their field. Past speakers have included Lise Doucette, Gary Young, Lonnie Bunch, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Gordon Carrera. And tonight, I'm delighted and we're honoured to be able to add Professor Philip Deloria to this list. So I suspect that some of you in this room will have a great deal of knowledge about Philip's work and his biography. He is, after all, one of the most consequential scholars of Native American indigenous studies in the world and comes from a family of American thinkers, scholars, activists, and artists. But for many of us here who have only a cursory knowledge of Native American studies, if any at all, I just want to spend a few minutes on Philip's biography, not least as a way of emphasizing what a huge privilege it is to have him giving the Bryant Lecture. Philip was appointed Harvard's first full professor of Native American history in 2018, after having spent 17 years at Michigan and six years at the University of Colorado. Given Philip's family background, I'd be very interested to know whether he feels it was almost inevitable he would end up in Indian studies. He's an enrolled member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. His great-grandfather was T.P. Sapa, also known as Philip Deloria, and was a prominent Yangtong Sioux political leader. Philip is the son of Barbara and Vine Deloria, Jr. Vine Deloria, Jr. was a professor and activist who served as the executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. Most famously, his father wrote the 1969 book, Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian Manifesto, which my 18-year-old child daughter, who's doing A-level history, told me that they studied for her exam that she's doing tomorrow, which was very heartening. <laughs> he was one of the most influential figures in 20th century Indian politics, law, and intellectual affairs. And perhaps later, we would love to hear about the influence on Philip's intellectual life of his mother, who was a librarian. Philip did not follow the usual route to academia. He started as a performance major at the University of Colorado and changed to music education. From a biography of Philip printed in Harvard Magazine, I read that he spent the 80s obsessed with making music videos. He said of the men in his family, if you look back three or four generations of Deloria men, they look like losers until they're 30. <laughs> Which I, I think is really heartening for a lot of us. Um, Philip returned to university for a master's in journalism and from there applied to the doctoral program in American studies from Yale. 
It was during this time that he conceived the idea for his dissertation, which would later become the book which would redefine Native American studies. Published in 1998, called Playing Indian, Philip's work explored the history of white people dressing up as Native Americans. Playing Indian initiated a new direction for Native American studies in US history, his history putting culture rather than social science front and center in understanding the Native American experience. In his second book, Indians in Unexpected Places, published in 2004, Philip explored Native Americans participating in modern life, in cars, in films, in sports, and in music, demonstrating not that this was an anomaly, but to insist on Native Americans as inextricably linked to modern life. Philip is also the author of a 2019 study of his great aunt, the artist Mary Sully, whose work he uncovered and analyzed as an intervention into the history of visual arts. Philip is the former president of the American Studies Association and the Organization of American Historians. He's an elected member of the American Academy, Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he was just elected to the American Philosophical Society, and he is the recipient of numerous prizes and recognitions. Through his work, Philip consistently prioritizes Native American concepts and beliefs, bringing to life overlooked, misunderstood, and dismissed narratives of indigenous histories and cultures. And in so doing, as we'll hear later, offers a different version to the popular and scholarly understandings of the USA. It's wonderful to have Philip to speak here today at the library. The library holds collections by and relating to Native Americans and First Nation histories and cultures, from the earliest maps and records of settler colonialism, including accounts of visits to the UK by tribal representatives, to extensive print holdings. We hold many materials in indigenous languages, broadsides and newspapers, accounts of visiting performers and artists, research monographs and in indigenous studies, and of course, the most recent works by contemporary <coughs> Native American and First Nation musicians, authors, graphic novelists and artists, such as Frank Walm, to Tommy Pico, Kali, sorry, Carly Fajardo and Amistine, Gord Hill, Rhiannon Sky Tafoya. Our curatorial teams, who are indebted to the work of Native American and indigenous scholars and library professionals, are actively working on making these materials more visible and accessible to our readers. We see this talk by Philip as part of our efforts to engage in these collections and these histories. So I'd like to welcome Philip to the stage. Philip will talk for around 50 minutes and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. So get those ready. Thank you. Well, Polly, thank you so much for the, the wonderful and gracious introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to the Eccles Center for hosting and sponsoring me. Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, it's it's been quite a quite a whirl here, you know, and uh, and really quite lovely. So I'm I'm really grateful, and to all of you who are out watching, hi. Yeah. So I'm going to jump right. I'm going to jump right in. Um, in the midst of the oops, and I'm going to kind of start up here. In the midst of the 2020 election uh, coverage, a meme rocketed around what we in the US would call Indian country, that sort of archipelago of material spaces, but also conceptual and emotional and affective places where native people imagine themselves together. So this meme rocketed around Indian country, generating bouts of outrage mixed with weary laughter among native folks. Uh, it showed a CNN news graphic that broke down voting returns by racial categories, but here was the kicker. Native American voters were listed as something else. <laughs> we all ask ourselves, was it possible that a staffer at a major American news organization could not recall the full range of constituencies found in the United States racial pantheon? <laughs> Apparently so. Uh, and this despite the fact that Native voter turnout in Wisconsin and Arizona, which were two of the four states that CNN had identified as being critical, had in fact, as Native voters, quite likely swung the election to Joe Biden. So American Indian people could do a little bit embrace the irony of that moment which arrived, it was duly noted, at the beginning of Native American Heritage Month. <laughs> a few took some small measure of solace, perhaps, from CNN's previous go-around with Indian country, 
in which their commentator, Rick Santorum, was let go after offering a similarly dismissive view of Indian America cast in historical terms. We birthed a nation from nothing, Santorum said. I mean, there was nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but candidly that, well, there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. Well, Santorum was wrong, of course, but Native people have corrected that error over and over and over again, and it never seems to stick. And we might ask ourselves, why not? Why, why does it work that way? And what would it look like if we remixed our stories, taking Native people seriously as agents and shapers of the American past? And I'll note that two friends and colleagues of mine, Pekka Hemelainen and Ned Blackhawk, have recently made such an effort in the form of very long synthetic books. My strategy tonight is different. Uh, so think of what follows as a series of just short essays each aiming not for a synthesis or a long historical arc, but for the assembling of a conceptual toolkit. So here we are in the United States. Uh, yeah, there we go. In the midst of a crisis surrounding the narrative politics of American history. What stories get told? How are they told? And in order to convey what lessons? And what stories must be silenced or reduced? because they carry moral obligation that many would prefer not to bear? Does American pluralism rest on a proliferation of stories or on a few singular narrative lines that organize some kind of social coherence? Our current crop of book banners are not only opposed to certain histories, they are actually and actively demanding the elevation of a very small set of familiar mythic tales. Most Americans have a clear picture of those stories, and I am guessing that perhaps you do as well. There's the now classic narrative of the city on the hill with its insistence on a particular species of religious freedom. And there's the evocative story of the founding fathers and the revolution, which supports a political vocabulary focused on things like liberty, citizenship, and righteous democracy. The tale of the frontier makes up a third story with westering immigrants being transformed by the wilderness, even as they invent American individualism and representative democratic institutions. These three stories have affinities. They braid together to form a kind of a narrative cord, a coherent tale explaining the divine origins of American exceptionalism, liberal subjecthood, social evolution, the naturalness of the nation state, and the relation of rights, freedoms, and obligations. But of course, there are others. There's a rags to riches story that evokes the myth of class transcendence, the possibility of social and economic success driven by dint of hard work on the part of individuals. And that story aligns well with the grossly overworked tale of the melting pot, uh, which celebrates challenging but ultimately egalitarian processes of assimilation. Despite the long-standing currents of xenophobia to, found, to be found in our country, the cheerful insistence that we are all immigrants striving for success continues to power much American political and cultural discourse. And it helps, I would argue, to thread together all five of these narratives. It's also true that these stories sometimes tussle with one another. The historian Frederick Jackson Turner, for example, explicitly set his frontier thesis against a story centered on the Civil War, which we can now name as a sixth national narrative, one that centers white on white struggle to transcend the legacies of slavery. Recounted to minimize black presence and agency, this version of the story understands the Civil War as white blood sacrifice for the nation's original sin. That story helped produce two variations, the South's powerful and mythic tale of the lost cause, rich with rebel flags, moonlight, and magnolias, and the idea of virtuous war would come to full fruition in the years after World War II as Americans celebrated the idea of the good war. All these stories, if you think of them, are all kind of twined together. Powerful. And they're all partially true in the ways that ideological formations must suggest some measure of congruence with a seemingly observable reality. Over the last 50 years, however, it is fair to say that the stories, these stories have been questioned and complicated by scholars, teachers, and the many people ignored in these stories. Indeed, in the context of the civil rights movement, 
Americans began turning to a new, and what we can think of as a seventh story, grounded in the African-American movement from slavery to freedom to civil rights. It offered a powerful challenge to all those other tales. As one recent commentator framed it, our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. Black Americans have fought to make them true. At the same time, this new story also reinforced what came to seem a basic premise of American society, that with shared struggle over time, we could fulfill the promises of the Declaration of Independence and make racial reconciliation possible. This was the linear narrative of progress and pluralism found in the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, um, where you can start at the basement in the depths of slavery and climb to the top where we see music and Michael Jordan and things like that. Um, and the young adult readers that elevated figures like Ruby Bridges, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King Jr. to cultural icons, the one that seemingly then would lead to Barack Obama. I was able to watch my children pass through this curriculum, um, and I suspect I'm not the only one um, you know, who has observed that. So this story, which once seemed radical, reinforced the tenets of liberalism, citizenship and rights, uh, refereed by the state. It fit well with all those other stories. But there is an eighth story, less visible, that points towards unique forms of American pluralism, not only as mythic narratives, but as pluralism in a political sense as well. It's a story that takes American Indian people seriously. It has the potential to transform and reanimate the stories we tell about the nation. It does not want to be forgotten. A useful way to enter this, American, this Native American story is through the indigenous constitution. It's a small constitution, a simple little constitution, uh, and it's contained within the Constitution of the United States. It begins with the notorious three-fifths clause, a mathematical formula for determining who and how to count the bodies of the nation. You can see here, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states, which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which will be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. The grammar, the convolutedness of this, of course, is not by accident. Historians have rightly focused on the North-South compromises that gave us three-fifths of all other persons, referring, of course, to enslaved people. But too frequently, however, we miss the only category of people to be subtracted from the formula altogether, Indians not taxed. So to designate Indians not taxed was to imagine, at least I think, an Indian who was taxed, a person who had presumably renounced their tribal citizenship, become naturalized to the United States, and taken on the responsibilities and rights of American citizenship, and was thus countable. The effect of the phrase, Indians not taxed, which is reaffirmed in the 14th Amendment, was to write Indian people into the United States Constitution in order to write them out of it. And why exclude them? Because Indian tribes are recognized in the American Constitution as distinct sovereign nations. The second article of the Indigenous Constitution then can be found in the Commerce Clause, which gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. The use of with rather than among for both tribes and foreign nations would seem to tell the tale, at least grammatically. Again, tribal nations are placed on the plane of foreign nations rather than the plane of the states. And because tribes are framed as being outside the United States, we can see the importance of the third article of the indigenous constitution, the Supremacy Clause, which carries particular relevance for a political group, American Indians, that has existed in external treaty relation to the United States. And here you can see it. Constitution of the laws, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges and every state shall be bound thereby. This constitutional article reminds us that treaties function among the highest bodies of law, an argument affirmed in 1829 by Chief Justice John Marshall, who observed that a treaty is in its nature a contract between two nations, not a legislative act, but in the United States, a different principle is established. Our Constitution declares a treaty to be the law of the land. Well, there can be no doubt 
that American imperial and colonial development over time weakened this thing, the indigenous constitution. Over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, Americans worked to bring native people under American jurisdictional authority, offering them a second class brand of assimilation that might someday lead to citizenship and tax paying and being counted in the census. The loss of self-determining tribal autonomies represents a major point of pain in these histories. But it is also the case that the new relationships between tribes and the United States also offers us an important point of possibility. In 1831, Chief Justice John Marshall defined a new tribal national relationship through the concept of domestic dependent nationhood. Tribes, he thought, were now reliant upon and subordinate to the federal government, while at the same time continuing to hold a kind of semi-independent national status. Indeed, Marshall had second thoughts about even this formula the following year in Worcester v. Georgia. This is the worst PowerPoint strategy ever, right? It's to like <laughs> load up the slide with all kinds of, so I'm not actually at, gonna ask you to sort of think about this, but what I've done is sort of laid out the indigenous constitution here on the left and figured, uh, pointed to moments where, in fact, in Worcester v. Georgia, some of those elements of the indigenous constitution are, in fact, reaffirmed, right, in this decision um, by John Marshall. So you don't have to read it, just take my word for it. Um, <laughs> so it just, he realized that he could not write off the indigenous constitution so early, but um, as I think many of us know, this opinion in Worcester v. Georgia didn't really take, and President Andrew Jackson proceeded apace with a policy called Indian removal which sought to clear the Southeast and the Midwest of native people, forced into desperate journeys to Indian territory, the states we now know as Kansas and Oklahoma. This will be familiar to many of you under the rubric of the Trail of Tears, right? Um, multiple of these trails, the Potawatomi Trail of Death, right? Another kind of um, version of this. And they're all heading to what would become Oklahoma, Indian territory, but they're also heading to Kansas, which turns out to be a quite interesting place, I think, in this history as well. So, what these cases left behind was not just some kind of tragic residue. If you combine these sometimes contradictory distinctions, the so-called Cherokee cases, for example, with the indigenous constitution, take them together and they suggest a new way of framing collective political identities within a pluralistic nation. So the United States owed native nations a trust responsibility. Courts have established this as a fact and called on the United States to be a good trustee even as it then recognized an attenuated form of politically distinct sovereign nationhood. Call it the trust sovereignty paradox. Both things are true simultaneously. And this legal status developed historically creates a novel and important American political structure across four distinct registers, federal, state, local, and tribal. And there you can see a couple of slides that I forgot to advance. <laughs> so the indigenous constitution was not doomed. Uh, it continues to function today, witness the surprising outcome of the 2020 Supreme Court decision in McGirt v. Oklahoma, which recognized treaty-based tribal jurisdiction in the former Indian Territory. The fundamental weirdness of John Marshall's domestic dependent nations appears then not as a bug, but a feature. One that has come roaring back to life over the last six decades as Native people have made tribal sovereignty into a real thing. Now, in the field of Native American history, we've spent much time over the last decades discussing the theory of what is called settler colonialism. And I'm not going to go into the details of this other than to observe two things. First, Settler colonialism predicts that settlers, that is to say people who come not to extract resources but to stay and settle, that these settlers will always have an incentive to erase, forget, and ghost indigenous people right out of their cultural memories. That's why even the New York Times, as it seeks to host discussions on race in America, joins CNN in being unable to remember that Indians exist. I've been sort of struck by this thing, which is a, you know, advertisement for this um, kind of New York Times newsletter called Race Related, which purports to talk about sort of racial issues in the United States. 
that literally establishes a racial hierarchy in the form of the size of the heads and the positions and all of this stuff, and literally leaves Native people out. Uh, stunning, stunning that this is uh, the world that we live in. So that's one thing. Second thing, because it founds new political orders in places like the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, settler colonialism is always about the land. It is not enough for Americans to wring our hands and regret about the very beneficial tragedies that led the nation to occupy much of the continent. As we are thinking about things like land acknowledgments, for instance, we might have a better sense of that history um, of these lands. So I want to offer you another tool, a set of five distinct acts, uh, practices that reveal how the American takeover was strategically responsive to the scope and nature of native land holding as it changed over time. So situate the first act in the British colonial era when land contracts, that is to say an economic frame that acknowledges Indian ownership through the mechanisms of the market, right, and treaties, that is to say a political practice that does the same through the structures of the state. When these things blurred together into an initial set of what we can think of as nation to nation relationships, the spatial imaginary of this first mode of land loss is vast, continental in scope. And I was able to look at an earlier version of a map like this today here at the British Library. It's quite stunning, these lines that literally extend completely across the continent. So rough balances of power, though uneven and shifting, were its reality. Diplomacy was its mode. Treaties were its form. And it extends through what one might otherwise call the colonial period into the first two decades of the early republic. A three-legged stool of federal policy frames the dynamics of a second mode. The Trade and Intercourse Acts made land transfer a federal matter, not a state or private matter. No longer could a state go and negotiate with an Indian tribe. It had to be the federal government. The Land Ordinance of 1785 created that grid structure that we saw a little bit earlier with that map of American counties. Uh, commodified land and enabled its large-scale transfer into the public domain and then back into the hands of the private sector. And third, the Northwest Ordinance laid out the political terms under which a colony could become a state. This second act was defined by Indian removal, compression, and containment, because you had to get 60,000 people into a colony in order to turn it into a state. So the scope of spatial imaginary shifted explicitly from the continental scope to the regional scope. In this case, the form of the would-be state. So these 60,000 settlers would arrange themselves on the newly gridded landscape. Um, and American political development then required Indian people to be removed, consolidated, and confined. Periodized the second moment as about a century long, roughly between 1787 and the addition of what we call the omnibus states of 1889. These are the kind of states of the Northern Plains. A third act, with Indian people now confined to these shrunken down reservation spaces, Americans inaugurated a new strategy of land taking. Call it neighborhood level dispossession. The reservation, collectively held land, could now be broken up into individual allotments of 160 acres, at which point the corrupt triangulation of property markets and the individualization of the federal trust relationship would work this kind of evil magic. Americans disaggregated reservation spaces and then desegregated them, interlacing non-native settlers into the resulting checkerboard and allowing them to extend still more claims over native land. The project of individualizing land went hand in hand with the attempted destruction of every aspect of tribal collectivity language, religion, political practice, social relations, and the family, perhaps captured most notoriously through the removal of generations of children from their parents and their cultures through the institution of the federal and church boarding school systems. Well, eminent domain might describe each of these acts, but for a fourth act, one might point more specifically to the upswing of reclamation-based and then later military-based eminent domain seizures in the early to mid 20th century. The Pick Sloan Missouri River Plan uh, for reclamation, a series of dams, uh, for example, flooded thousands of acres of the best bottomlands on the Missouri reservations, including the allotments held by people in my family. And they offer a kind of emblematic example. The 2016 Dakota Access Pipeline resistance at Standing Rock makes it clear that this mode of land taking continues on today. 
And finally, the Indian Reorganization Act, also called the IRA for short, frames a fifth and final act, beginning in 1934 and introducing new modes of colonial management. This act, the IRA, ended the allotment of Indian land, created tribal governments, and encouraged native collective land holding, all to the good. But these things were accompanied by strong federal oversight that was, in effect, a kind of neo-imperial form of indirect rule. It's hard to put an end date on this federal strategy, perhaps like eminent domain, there actually isn't one. But let's return at the end of this history to those reimagined and reinvigorated tribal relations that characterize our world today. One might point to a two decade confluence marked by the reemergence of American Indian sovereignty in which the indigenous constitution and treaties took on new political shape. So consider, for instance, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971, which introduced the corporate form into Indian governance, right? Not tribal governance now, but corporations, tribal corporations. Or the 1975 Indian Self-Determination Act, which encouraged tribes to contract to with the federal government for their own trust services. Or even the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan, which led to severe budget cuts in Indian country and a counter move to establish new forms of economic sovereignty. Or the 1988 Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which helped frame a new economic base around gaming, which tribes used to expand self-determination, social services, governance capacity, and new enterprises. These recent histories matter for today, even as we recall massive land loss Native tribal governments, those novel political forms, are as likely to be thinking about joint land management agreements, about shared jurisdiction, and about a variety of strategies for gaining their land back. There's even a hashtag thing, hashtag land back. So the last 50 years of tribal experimentation and capacity building constitute an, an under-recognized resource, I think a vastly under-recognized resource, for Americans to rethink social justice as it relates to political form. It's an experiment in structured pluralism, federal obligation, and state negotiated partnerships. This story is not like any of the mythic narratives through which Americans narrate the story of the United States, but might it become one? Well, now that we've got a legal and political way to imagine tribes, are you still with me? Yeah, okay. We've got the indigenous constitution, we've got the trust sovereignty paradox, we've got a clear sense about how the nation built itself around Indian land, the five acts. We might then, in a few gestural sketches, consider a few possibilities for reimagining new American histories that take better account of Native American pasts and presents. So consider, for example, an Indian rereading of the American Civil War. This is where we start and stop every survey in American history. You go up to the Civil War, you go after the Civil War. What if we reimagined it not as a North-South struggle, but as an East-West continental fight? Its land-grabbing aspirations laid bare in the legislation that was passed in 1862. This would be the Homestead Act, the Morrill Act, the Pacific Railroad Act. These things made it clear that future American development rested upon a final snatching up of the Indian territory of the West. Unsurprisingly, the 1860s, the years of the Civil War, saw such land snatching preceded by massive violence, a parallel war, not civil, waged against Indian people. So the politics of plunder helped produce the Minnesota-Dakota uprising in 1862 and then immediate campaigns to ethnic cleanse the Northern Plains. The year 1863 saw the massacre of hundreds of Shoshone people at Bear River in Idaho. In the summer of 1864, the Navajo suffered under the death and removal of the Long Walk. A few months later, the Cheyenne and Arapaho were slaughtered at Sand Creek. California Indians suffered regular massacres, large and small. The Civil War then was a continental conflict waged on multiple fronts with two linked objectives. It named, aimed not only to save the nation from the threat of disunion, right, and to eliminate slavery, but to guarantee and to order its future in land. And it was in no way exceptional. Colonial and imperial wars often function as multipolar conflicts involving indigenous interests and indigenous armies, not just random guys in the woods, armies. The Seven Years' War was literally the French and Indian War. The American Revolution 
was strategically structured by native alignments and enemies. And the official ending of both wars was no ending at all for Indian alliances continued fighting their own wars against colonial settlement. The Northwest Indian War, sort of the first big war of the new nation, required the new president, George Washington, to devote five-sixths of the federal budget to the US military and crafted national consolidation around a standing army, which the founding fathers absolutely did not want to do. The War of 1812 must account for the simultaneous struggles of Tecumseh's War and the Red Stick War. Between 1816 and 58, the Seminoles waged not one, not two, but three wars against the United States. It was considered the Vietnam quagmire of the early 19th century. Comanches fought from the 1820s until 1875. The Lakota fought until 1877 and didn't actually believe they were defeated until 1890. Apaches fought into the 1890s. Was there ever a moment in American history in which somewhere on the continent, the United States was not fighting one long Indian war. And what about the question of enslavement, so central to our current narrative struggles over American history? That story, too, looks different from Indian country. Before any European set foot in the Americas, this continent, our continent, hosted a range of, not your continent, our continent, hosted a range of indigenous unfreedom captivity and enslavement. There was slavery for labor, for status, for sacrifice, temporary enslavement for the payment of a debt, raiding and captivity for a literal trade in slaves, unfreedom as a replacement for a dead relative, spiritual power to be extracted in the taming of a captive, all these and more. Add into that mix the forms of unfreedom that Europeans brought with them, chattel slavery for sure, but also convict labor, hostage slavery, indenture. So the meeting of native, African, and European slave systems produced new hybrid forms. The extreme violence of the slave raid systems of the South and the Spanish-inflected systems of the Great Plains and Great Basin. French slave trading circuits sourced Indian slaves from deep in the continent, sent them to the Caribbean, and every English colonial war against Indians seems to have doubled as a slave raid. The five tribes of the southeast, of course, embraced the chattel enslavement of African peoples, a legacy painfully visible in their politics up to the present day. And when it came to the unfreedom of native people, many of these slaveries were deeply gendered, asking us to contemplate historical continuities in the current crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and people. And one would think that the 13th Amendment to the ended slavery would have, in fact, ended Indian slavery. But as Andres Resendis and Benjamin Madley and other scholars have recounted, American enslavement of Indians in New Mexico, California, and the Great Basin continued, in some cases, deep into the 19th century. So North American slavery, in that sense, was indigenous coming and going. Uh, and on both ends, it was genocidal in nature. In the early Spanish Caribbean, slavery was a mode of death dealing in and of itself. Starvation plus killing work plus the denial of the reproduction of the population. California enslavement followed similar patterns. So North America then might be considered one of the most complex and deadly slave continents in the entire history of the planet. And what of our deep history, our planetary history? We've long been saddled with the old Clovis first theories of Bering Strait migration uh, through ice-free corridors unfolding about 13,000 years ago. Archaeologists put a lot of time and energy and authority into this story. But genetic and archaeological evidence has now pushed human history on the continent uh, past 20,000 years, meaning that, as has happened in Australia, for example, uh, where, where the dates keep getting pushed back and are now in the sort of 65,000 year range, right? Um, our ancestors in North America lived through significant climate change and thus may soon someday tell us a story well suited for our own moment of climate catastrophe. Then there's the question of the wealth generated by all those Indian lands. As recent scholarship has shown, that wealth is not an abstraction. For you can literally follow Indian money to the capitalization of state finances, banks, corporations, and university endowments. This land grab universities project has been a particularly uh, telling one. And it's not just the land. It's the investments of Indian capital held in trust accounts 
flexible and fungible. That money pulled the southern states out of bankruptcy and paid for much of their infrastructure. Now, I've excised in the interest of time any number of these stories, magical tales of the first Indian think tank, the Society of American Indians, the high drama plot of international lobbying carried on at the League of Nations by the Haudenosaunee leader, uh, Descaje, the social commentary narrative surrounding Mat Matilda Jocelyn Gage and the native influence on the suffrage movement, and more and more and more. Right? All of these things are there. So do try this exercise at home. Pick your favorite moment in American history and see if you can't find American Indian people who have been shoved to the rear of that story and then elevate them in a new story. This has been the long range project of African American history, which has modeled a full range of strategies for this work incredibly successfully, I think, including one of the key engines for crafting new narratives. Um, what I like to think of as what many African American theorists have theorized as the speculative mode which embraces the affect of fiction, the revealing possibilities of critical fabulation, various forms of futurism, even the historical counterfactual. So I want to pick one last example and tell it to you as a story. So in September 1778, in the midst of the war for independence, the United States signed a treaty of alliance with the Delaware Nation, hoping to secure their military partnership in a planned assault on Detroit. The treaty guaranteed Delaware ownership of their lands and included this mostly forgotten but rather extraordinary promise found in Article 6. And once one gets through the incredibly legalistic gobbledygook at the beginning, you can see that is an invitation, along with other tribes, to join the present confederation and form a state whereof the Delaware nation shall be the head and have a representation in Congress. So today we read this passage and kind of shake our heads. It's sad and, and weird at the same time, and it's easy to just forget about it. But what if we imagined otherwise? So close your eyes and take yourself back to March 10th, 1781, the day on which the 14th state, not Vermont, but Lenape, joined the Union. The road to the state, America's first Indian state, had in fact been an improbable one. In the fall of 1778, with the treaty, this treaty freshly signed, the American commander, Lachlan McIntosh, launched a failed expedition against Detroit, only to see the Delaware step in with a daring plan of winter warfare. A Delaware-led native army swept across Ohio and took Detroit in March of 1779, followed by the July capture of Fort Niagara, where they freed the, American, the imprisoned American officer, Lieutenant Colonel William Stacy, who demonstrated his gratitude by advocating forcefully for Delaware interests within the Continental Congress. Delaware leaders then negotiated a Haudenosaunee withdrawal from the British alliance, sorry, <laughs> forestalling what would otherwise have been the devastating Sullivan campaign of total warfare across New York State, which, had those things taken place, would have opened the door to post-war American ex imperial expansion. In the first months of 1780, the now substantial Indian Confederacy made its plans known to George Washington. They would protect the Northern Front from the British while mustering a significant fo uh, force at the Princeton area farm of the Indian agent George Morgan. Washington could then press the British in the south with support along the Atlantic Corridor from the Delaware. And this move to New Jersey was not coincident as the Delaware had young future leaders either enrolled at the College of New Jersey, soon to be called Princeton, or preparing to do so. And that included the son of the Delaware leader, White Eyes. This part I'm not making up. These kids were there studying to go to Princeton, right? And White Eyes was this incredibly visionary kind of, uh, kind of leader. So things moved fast that autumn. The British surrender in December, followed by the dramatic appearance of the Delaware leaders before Congress. They reminded the Americans they had effectively won the Western theater of the war, finalized American victory in the North, and supported the successful Southern campaign. A confederation of tribes now sought the promised statehood. And under the United States Confederation model, the relative independence of an Indian state was perhaps not all that dissimilar to the political claims of other states, which were kind of wild and all over the map. They had diverse origins, social systems, and political 
interests. So this state, Lenape, was not large. The state's many enemies made sure of that. But the existence of Lenape shaped the subsequent course of American history, making possible the post-1812 state of Tecumseh in the Great Lakes region uh, and the hard-won peninsular state of Seminole. Not improbable that the Seminoles could have actually held off enough to like, create their own state. And in fact, after the War of 1812, the British suggested that they create a barrier, what they called a barrier state, an Indian barrier state between British holdings and the American holdings. So these things are partly made up, um, but partly not. So these things then uh, made possible the incorporation of the Hawaiian state, or the Hawaiian kingdom as an indigenous state, the Indian territory state of Sequoia, and the establishment of Comanche and Lakota, these native states. And then of course there were the late breaking southwestern states of Pueblo and Dineta, not to mention Alaska of course, and the indigenous centric politics of the upper Midwest, Pacific Northwest, and elsewhere. Arguably, Lenape made possible the formal statehood of the United States 20th century imperial acquisitions, including Puerto Rico and the Pacific Confederated State. Without Lenape, those places might have lingered forever in an ambiguous territorial status. <laughs> so the Indian state surely shaped post-war, uh, post-Civil War reconstruction as Lenape, Tecumseh, and Seminole developed tentative pre-war abolitionist sentiments into full-throated support of African-American political autonomy in the southern states, and the post-war carve-out of the Afrocentric state of Douglas from Indian territory. The support of the indigenous states in the mid-20th century would help elevate the possibility of a black state in the south. So, I understand that my story is, shall we say, over-exuberant. <laughs> it is worth remembering then exactly how the dream of Lenape faltered and died. On November 5th, 1778, with the tree ink on the treaty barely dry, an American militiaman shot and killed White Eyes, the main Delaware leader, simply for being an Indian. The Americans then lied to the Delawares, saying that he had died of smallpox. The Delaware splintered most shifting their alliance to the British. In February 1782, a group of 150 starving Christian Delaware returned to their Ohio village at Gnadenhutten to collect stored food and crops left behind in the field, where they were rounded up by an American militia who locked them in a house, debated, and had a nice civil dem democratic debate about what to do with them, decided to kill them in the morning, and in fact massacred them the next day. The young Indian leaders in Princeton left. Like his father, White Eye's son was casually killed for simply being an Indian. So the state of Lenape was a contingent possibility for about 47 days. Now I started thinking about Lenape as a teaching tool, a device to get students to look closely at the sometimes surprising provisions found in treaties and to seek out Indian goals and negotiating strategies in documents that often keep those goals hidden. It was a short step from there to think about other oddball political formations, Vermont, Texas, California, and Hawaii, all of whom kind of claim to be independent. Washington, D.C., a very weird and anomalous place. The lost state of Franklin, uh, the ghost state of Jefferson, West Virginia, the political organizer Edward, Mc Edward McCabe's efforts to strategize toward a black state in Indian territory in the late 19th century. And in fact, the 1905 Indian Territory Convention that did in fact propose the new state of Sequoia. So there's a deeply buried thread over a century long in which a handful of individuals did in fact advocate for Indian states. These histories suggest a more contingent quality to American political form and structure than one might otherwise imagine. Now some might point to Reconstruction and its civil rights narrative as the moment when multi-racial American democracy became something of a possibility. Others might suggest the 1964 Immigration Act, an immigrant narrative that assumes both assimilation and difference within the paradigm of liberal citizenship. But the story of Lenape suggests a different possibility in which multiracial democracy functions at the level of collective rights rather than individual ones and has distinct origins both inside and outside the constitutional tradition. So Indian people held tight to the sovereignty of the indigenous constitution, even as they were pulled into the jurisdiction and citizenship regimes of the American nation. And in that process, 
They created new structures for multiracial, multicultural, multi-sovereign American democracy. So what the fantasy of Lenape asks from us is a rec recognition of the political status of federally recognized tribes today. Their place established by treaties very much like the 1778 Treaty of Fort Pitt. For doesn't the United States actually have 574 indigenous states of America right now? We do. Semi-autonomous political entities with self-governance, dual citizenship, existing and structured relationships with other American states and with the federal government. So Lenape's story seems insanely improbable, but I think it narrates us into thinking about political structures that do actually exist and that might come to exist in a future such as ours, full of contingency, uncertainty, and danger. Well, my tool book, my toolbox, my tool box, my tool box for, I mean, I started to say tool belt, you know, and then I couldn't quite get it figure it out. Tool kit for remixing the American past is loaded up with lists. There are the seven master narratives of US history. There are the three articles of the indigenous constitution. There are the five acts of American empire. There are a tally of new histories. And by way of conclusion, there are the five things that native people say. These lists are obviously heuristics, things to think with. They are likely more than seven stories, three articles, five acts, and native people obviously say more than five things. <laughs> so here's one more, though, one more list, last in a series of these thought experiments, little hooks upon which we might try to drape some new stories, spurs to tell them. And in this case, crucially, the list offers observations centered in indigenous critique. So the first thing. We know you, but we never understood you. From the first days of contact, Europeans wondered, can we understand these people? And they decided that they could. But over time, those observers stopped wondering much about whether native people understood them. It didn't really seem to matter a whole lot. So the first thing native people have said is this, we've seen enough to figure, out, figure you out, but we don't really understand you. We don't understand why you love property and ownership so much. We don't understand your interest in elevating the individual over the collective. We don't understand why you separate out the category science from the category religion. We wonder why you measure time and history rather than being in place and space. We see that this is how you do things, but we are hard pressed to figure out why. And we're not saying these things in order to be critical, so don't attach yourselves to us in order to launch a critique of your own Western society, please. <laughs> We're saying in a flat and neutral observational voice that your belief systems don't make sense to us and you might not want to universalize them. <laughs> Second thing, we want our stuff back. <laughs> so there's the land that was taken. There's the wealth legacy of American capital. There's the plunder of graves for racial science. There's the ethnographic and archeological collecting that brought a flood of native material pouring into American institutions. And so yes, we want our stuff back. We want our ancestors to be put back to rest along with their grave goods. Our sacred objects, we want them back for our own use. Those objects of cultural patrimony that belong to us as collectives, we want those back too. And while it seems unthinkable, that the United States might actually return some of that land, there are in fact new possibilities coming up all the time. And maybe it's not so unthinkable after all. Third thing, we have a few things to say. For a very long time, civilized intellectuals made fun of us. They made fun of our understandings of the world. They thought we were primitive, superstitious, animists, terrified of nature, ignorant, but listen to the way that ecologists talk today. They say stuff like this, soil is alive. Forests are cooperative communities with trees willingly sharing resources, even across species. Trees we now know communicate through interconnected fungal networks. They know rather precisely what is going on in terms of water levels and nutrient flows and insect predators. These are exactly the kinds of things that native people have been saying for a really long time. Because when one lives in intimate relation with a changing environment for tens of thousands of years, one in fact creates a science, or whatever we want to call it, of observation, experiment, consolidation, and review. And that knowledge is then passed along across generations. 
So one's practice may function without labs and lasers, but may come to understand similarly deep things. Because if biologists start to sound like Indians these days, guess what? So do theoretical physicists. And God knows where that's going to take us. Fourth thing, we're not like the others. And that matters. So Indians are written into the Constitution in order to be excluded from it. Indian people have a dual and simultaneous claim on their own retained sovereignty and as people with a trust relationship claim on the United States. These two things help constitute Native people as tribal nations with formal political relationships with the United States. Not a racial group, but a political one. From an indigenous point of view, multiracial democracy began with collective rights, not individual ones. And since tribal national life is flourishing, if indeed still confronting significant challenges, might it not be an alternative way to think about new strategies for racial reconciliation, even new political structures within a pluralistic nation? And the fifth thing, we're still here. In the 1950s and 60s, the United States tried to shut down American Indian tribal governments, but they came roaring back in the decades after, bolstered by a new commitment to upholding the treaties. And Native American demography, starting from a low point around 1900, when about 250,000 people appeared in the census data, not very many people, that's a nothing but increase. Today, the Census Bureau reports 9.7 million Native people. That's both alone and in combination. It's all quite complicated. It's about 2.9% of the US population. So it's not just that we're still here. It's that we are, in fact, growing. And yet, we're still here, get said, and get said a lot, because despite the gains, that settler colonial prediction of ongoing indigenous erasure continues to hold. These things feel familiar to me because people in my family, and so many others, so many other families, have literally been saying the same thing for four generations. And that's because the erasure is structural. It goes on. It's always renewable, and it's always renewed. And thus, it requires the continuous repetition of, we're still here. We're still here. And often, we're still here is said as much for Native people as it is for others. Because speaking of survival is a mechanism for pursuing survival. Or better, pursuing that unique indigenous quality the Anishinaabe writer Gerald Visner called survivance. Not just survival, not just resistance, but a sense of courage, life, dignity, autonomy, legacy, wise engagement, resilience and caring, and affirming humor in the face of CNN graphics and world historical disasters that might otherwise have produced only a sour, cynical irony. Visner's survivance refuses clean definition. He was our postmodern native theorist in the 1990s, and thank God for that. So it refuses clean definition. It insists on remaining an open concept, ready for contingency, and offering not only humor, but hope, and thus, in our moment right, of history wars and hot wars, of disintegrating democracy and racial contest and realignment, climate disaster, capital-induced paralysis, aren't those lessons of indigenous survivance well worth learning? After all the bad stuff, all the hurts of history, Native people are still here. Can we bottle that up, pass it around? A bit of tonic for the years ahead? Some time watching Reservation Dogs, which kind of gives it to us. And it points us to a final metaphor, that of what I think of as the narrative treaty relative to all these stories and the storytelling. An agreement among all those who need their stories told, who rely upon those of us who care about history, to look for those new stories of survivance. There's no land session involved in this treaty. None of that bad stuff happens in this treaty, just an agreement to work hard to maintain an honorable relationship with one another, one of mutual support, alliance, and respect. Everyone's signature is welcomed and appreciated on that treaty. Thank you. Wow. 
That should have been a series, of, obviously. <laughs> that was phenomenal. And thank you so much for that really deep and, and rich um, overview and invocation, and also for the challenge that you gave us all, I think, to insert the American Indian into our understanding of American histories and narratives. And perhaps we should extend that here to insert the American Indian into how we think about the British history's relation with America as well, very much. Um, that was sort of, I'm sort of slightly overwhelmed. It was really wonderful. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to ask you one question but not take, up, take advantage of my position as chair, but I do have one question I wanted to ask you, which in a way um, sort of brings you back to you and this story back to you, which was, and I sort of alluded to it in my introduction, was that um, there's been much more of a focus, perhaps understandably, um, because of their public presence on the significance of your paternal line um, on the, the field and also on your own life. But um, we're very fond of librarians here. <laughs> and um, so I'd really be interested to ask you about the influence on your sensibilities and on your work. Um, and on your view of the world, of your mother, library, mother Barbara, who's a librarian, and your grandmother, who is a librarian too. Could, you, could we start with that, and then I'm going to come to the audience for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I mean, so I, I love to talk about my mom, and one of the ways I, I always want to talk about my mom concerns the, my 2019 book, Becoming Mary Sully, because this was a collection of... Um, art, 134 of these images that had passed from my great aunt, my one great aunt to my other great aunt to my grandfather, who looked to my mother and said, I don't know what to do with this, but you're a librarian. <laughs> you figure it, catalog it or something, <laughs> right? Catalog it. So my grandmother was the children's librarian in the Dav Davenport Public Library children's room. And when I was a kid, I used to you know, go there and she would read to stories circles. And so I, I jumped into libraries very early through my grandmother. My mom, um, you know, went to library science, went to, did a master's degree in library science in part to do research with my dad. But she also was really dedicated to sort of to being a librarian. She was the librarian of the Fairhaven Library in Bellingham, Washington when we grew up. My brother and I would basically go from school to the Fairhaven Library and we'd read until the end of my mom's shift. And my mom was really good at sort of, you know, pushing us in certain directions. Well, maybe you want to try that. Maybe you want, she was a librarian, right? She had books and she had books that she wanted us to, to take a look at. She wanted us not to just sort of read a narrow, limited version of kids fiction. She wanted to try to expand our, expand our minds. She brought to, uh, she brought home an old set of encyclopedias from, uh, <laughs> you know, from the librarian that had been, the library that had been decommissioned and we sat there and I like, like at some early moments, kind of started reading the encyclopedia, you know? So I mean, so my mom always had that kind of um, sensibility about the possibilities that could be found in, in books, um, you know, and engagement. And so even as my dad kind of gave us all a certain form of intellectual life, mm -hmm. my mom also gave us a really important form of intellectual life. And, and did she play a role in the, the forming of your political sort of views as well, in the same way your father might have done or not? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, my mom was a, a sort of moderating force on my dad. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my dad was, was a really creative thinker, you know, and he was totally willing to step outside the box. He hated anything that looked dogmatic, which meant that he sometimes went down roads that were pretty sketchy, you know? My mom always tried to kind of pull him back, you know, from some of those things. So in some ways, you know, my, my dad's legacy is one of sort of intellectual adventurism, you know, and my mom's legacy of one, is one of a, a caution and rigor, I would say. You know, not to say my dad is not rig was not rigorous, but, but my dad was expansive um, to, the, to the point of sometimes being less rigorous. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not going to exploit my position here, so I'm going to go to the audience. If you put your hands up, and I think there are roving mics for questions. Is there a question... Who has a question for Philip? Okay, over here. Thank you. Hi. 
Hello, Philip. Thank you very much for that talk. It was um, very intense. There was a lot to sort of try and get our little brains around, and I think I'm going to have to spend a few days going back over a lot of it. Um, I know this is going to sound a bit strange, but um, I have always, since I was quite young, had an interest in Native American history and Native Americans and what was happening with them. And one of my earliest memories was being used as what was called a GCSE. Um, uh, was, th these are exams you have at school. Um, and they had some teachers that they, were cha they, they wanted to uh, train. Uh, and so they got some of the, the brightest kids in the class to read something out and um, and then the teachers would cross-examine you because there was a sort of oral part of the um, English literature or English language course. And these, because it all changed from the old system to a new system, I had to pick something out. And I found a book about uh, on the shelves in my little library that we had at my school. And I read this section out to these teachers. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the section was about the kind of way Native American people were portrayed, uh, the penny dreadful type uh, literature, the, 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 you know, the, the ghastly sort of um, little booklets that could, people could buy in New York and tell them all about you know, what was happening to the people in the West by these terrible natives who were sort of you know, doing what they were doing to them. And so there was all this kind of uh, media, let's put it that, the media of that time, and it was seeping right down into the population and they were reading these little penny magazines they could buy and it was all very salacious and all very horrible. And the reason I'm, I'm saying this is when I said this to these, and I read this section to these teachers, uh, they started saying to me, oh, do you want to be a social worker? And I thought, no, I don't want to be a social worker. What I want to do is look at why people are portrayed in a certain way and what impact that has. And that also informs me as someone of Irish heritage, the way people are portrayed. And I found it very interesting. So I'm really asking you a question, but I found it very interesting what you were saying about uh, uh, physics and all of that. So this whole notion of how the Native American peoples have been portrayed over time, how do you see this shifting in the current climate, and I use that word climate especially, how do you see it shifting? Is there more respect now for Native Americans in, as a result of that? And I've never become a social worker, actually. I'm <laughs> studying Native Anyway, I'll go. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, thank you for the question. I mean, it's, um, I, I think one of the things that's really important over the last 50 years is that Native people have taken more and more control over the means of production, right, of image production. And I put up reservation dogs, which is sort of like something that everyone in Indian country sort of like revels in. It's a, you know, kind of a, you know, a series. And, um, and it's smart and it's funny and it's very, very sort of native centric. It's not just native centric, it's kind of like Oklahoma centric and it's kind of town specific, right? I mean, it's sort of Sterling Harjo's stories. Um, and I think, you know, I think one of the things like, I've, I had a couple students do a really interesting project a couple years ago about sort of native folks doing documentaries in the 1970s through sort of public television. This seemed to be a really interesting and promising kind of, kind of moment, right? Where native folks said, oh, we could jump into that niche and we could sort of seize the means of production. We could start making our own kinds of doc. And if, and if you look at that period, there's tons of native documentaries that came out of the 70s and, and 80s. And then once you started having things like YouTube, like native folks are the masters of the short form YouTube video, right? <laughs> I mean, they're really great and they're super smart. And then you get enough people moving into the world of film and these, and then all of a sudden you're in television and you're in streaming services and you've got all these different kinds of things happening. Um, you know, so, um, and you've got tribal production units, you know, that actually make really good films, um, things like that. So I think th if there's a moment of change right now, it's a moment over the last, you know, X number of years, 50, 60 some years, where Native folks have jumped into, I just use visual culture as an example, but we do the same thing with literature, the same thing with art. So Native people are much, and, and you know, I, I mean, not to make a, a 
crude and dogmatic statement, right? But like a lot of the creative, the most creative stuff comes from people who exist on the margins, who people who are living through and kind of dealing with certain kinds of historical traumas and trying to figure those things out and express them and come to terms with them and deal with them, right? Um, so there's a, that has always been the place right, where creativity really sort of, you know, kind of functions and native creativity is right there, you know? And it's like that world of American Indian sort of you know, arts and humanities and cultural production is just thriving. And, and yes, and suddenly, all of a sudden, you find institutions becoming more interested in it, right? Every mainstream American art museum is trying to like kind of deal with this right now. Oh, let's go hire a lot of native curators. Oh, we didn't really build a pipeline of that, did we? You know, um, right? So all of those kinds of things are happening. And so to me, I mean, it looks like the future here is one that is on an upward trajectory in terms of sort of native authority. Um, you know, and, and uh, ability to sort of speak right within that. Thank you. So down here at the front. Hopefully I won't forget my question. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I just kind of to follow up on that idea of, um, you know, do you see this as kind of organic or kind of structural? And I, I think in terms, you know, yeah, th that this kind of growth is it kind of inevitable as kind of the population increases, as you know, the kind of success of, of, of native gaming, particularly for the, the, the Southern <coughs> Seminoles? Um, yeah, I was just kind of to hear your views on that point, uh, on, to kind of expand on that. Yeah, I don't think it's inevitable at all. <clears throat> so, you know, first thing, I mean, <clears throat> my dad pointed this out a long time ago. He said, you know, the interest in Indian folks is cyclical. And it kind of comes and goes. And there's a sort of 20, 25 year cycle. And if you think that things are getting better because you're in one point of the cycle, just wait a while and see what happens, <laughs> right? So, so I'm not at all convinced that there's a linear kind of progressive trajectory that's happening. Um, you know, um, but I think it is a moment. And I think there, I don't want to say structural adjustments, right? But I think historical adjustments you know, are in fact happening. It's not going to be a cycle. It's not going to be the same thing. But I think, so that's one thing, is the sort of like quasi-cyclical nature. The second thing is that, you know, I mean, we are still living in a settler colonial moment, right? And those moments, um, they never go away. I really do believe this, right? It's a that is a structural thing. Settler colonialism is a structural thing, not to get all Patrick Wolfie on us for academics who study this, and I know most of us don't. So, but, you know, um, Colonialism and settler colonialism in a place like North America, and I think other settler colonial spaces, is always going to find new kinds of ways and means and strategies. You know? And we don't know quite what they are, but I think we have to assume that they will be there. Right? And so, for actually, we can name one right now. So for the Brackeen case that's sitting before the US Supreme Court, um, which looks like it's about child adoption, and in fact is, um, is an effort to destroy Native American political sovereignty. I mean, and it's funded by who? And who are the lawyers who are engaged in this stuff? I have friends in the room who could tell us much more about this. Um, but my you know, rough sense is like, these are energy companies. Uh, you know, these are legal firms that represent the sort of high gloss, you know, kind of evil capitalism of places, right? So that's who is attacking Indian country right now through particular kinds of means, right? And it's super dangerous. And it has the possibility, you know, if that case, if the Brad Keen case goes wrong, as we kind of, I think, kind of anticipate with our Supreme Court, it might, right? It's not only going to mess up Indian country, it's going to mess up all kinds of constitutional laws and orders, right? So what people are willing to do in order to kind of push Indian folks back down, right, is, can be quite extraordinary. So, Yes, I'm happy, I'm optimistic. I watch Reservation Dogs and I'm like, yeah, this is really great. I look at the cool art, I listen to the fantastic music. This is all really good. I don't think anybody in the Indian country feels complacent right, about this at all. I mean, every, it's always a moment of danger. Right? It's always a moment of danger. Thank you. Okay, I think two, two more questions. I think, sorry, there's one at the back there. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm wondering kind of what you do when um, historical narratives try to uh, incorporate native history into a complicity with a colonial narrative. So I'm thinking of like this resurgence of, well, you know that indigenous tribes also kept slaves. 
Um, and, and to, you know, so what you do when there are multiple narratives kind of interacting with each other and the Native American history is kind of used as a, to pit mm -hmm. conflicts together, if that kind of articulates it in a good enough way. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a hard question, right? I mean, on the one hand, if you're in the position of the cultural producer, right, you have to work in the crude sort of like terrain of narrative. Um, if, but I'm not that. <laughs> if you're an academic, you get to work in the terrain of subtlety and complexity and say like, I must remind you of how complicated this is. I must remind you that that narrative you're reading is a simple, a sim oversimplified narrative. You know, I must remind you that what you're getting is basically a, a tweet and nothing, you know, nothing more than that. And I must remind you, right, that politics is the art of simplifying stuff down into a tweet, right? I mean, into a slogan, right? And, and the, we should aspire to think complexly within our political kinds of positioning, right? And not to let ourselves be brainwashed and seduced by simplistic kinds of narratives, no matter, you know, no matter where they come from. So that always positions me then as a critic rather than as a producer, which is, true, kind of what academics end up doing, <laughs> you know. But I think, I mean, one of the things that I've been trying to do, and actually, I mean, so this is what I've just talked through is a bit of a project, and I've been really interested in sort of telling stories, doing counterfactual kinds of stories. The first slide that I put up there of these sort of modernist horses is this kind of thing that this critical fabulation I've imagined where an Indian person who's a character in a James Welch novel carries Walter Benjamin across the Pyrenees on the last day of his life. I, you know, I mean, this didn't happen, obviously, right? But it's a way of sort of framing a story that is complex, right, and that has a politics attached to it. I'm really sorry, but I think we are right up against time because we've got a live online audience. I'm sorry, Susan, I can see your hand is up. I'm terribly sorry. Um, all right, got one more question really quickly. <laughs> Olivia, you swung it. Um, just a quick question, if you can. Susan. This, this is, is wonderful. But it, I mean, not, my, my question is not wonderful. The talk was wonderful. Um, but my question is, is a very short and simple one. I, I would like to look up and know more about the Burkine case. How do you spell it? Oh, that's a good question. That's a very good, yeah. B-R-A-C-K-E-E-N. Okay. I'm looking over at Steve to make sure I'm getting it right. Yes. Thank you. So I'm, I'm so sorry we don't have time for more questions, but I know that we all want to thank Philip for what was an incredibly generative and provocative, in the best sense of the word, talk. And thank you so much for being the 2023 Bryant Lecture. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you all.